Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of the Extracellular Vesicle Club. This is an event of the International Society for Extracellular Vesicles, and we've been holding this event every week, approximately every week, since the start of the COVID pandemic. Um, so we're very excited to have with us today a guest from the Americas, also from the Americas where I'm located, but from South America, um, and specifically from the Universidad de los Andes in Chile. Um, so Karina Pino Lagos is going to present some work that was just recently published on how uh, EVs from T-regs um, that contain or that display neuropilin are going to be um, helping with, with immunity. Um, so Karina, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and please, um, please go ahead. I'd just like to ask everybody to put your comments and questions in the chat box. And then after Karina's presentation, we'll get to you and let you, um, let you ask your questions um, and interact with our speaker. Karina, over to you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Um, uh, today, I'm going to show you some of the, uh, the results that we obtained during these two or three years in the lab. Um, I'm, as a formation, I'm an immunologist, and we are interested in regulatory T cells, which are a cell population that are in charge of uh, immune tolerance. And several years ago, um, we became interested in, uh, in a protein called um, neuropilin-1. This, this uh, protein works as a co-receptor. Um, and it was described uh, first in neurons and later on immune cells, specifically on dendritic cells and also on T cells. And the first uh, function that was uh, thought um, was, a, a, as a, was a molecule to stabilize the interaction be between dendritic cells and T cells, specifically dendritic cells and regulatory T cells, because as you can see here in this, in this picture, uh, dendritic cells express um, neuropilin-1, and also regulatory T cells are characterized by the high expression of neuropilin-1 versus uh, naive uh, T cells or activated T cells at that moment. Um, later, I think it was uh, in 2000, 2012, perhaps, um, neuro, there were two uh, papers uh, stating that neuropilin-1 could serve as a specific marker for natural T-Rex. And that was the, the, the starting point for us to, to study this molecule because we were interested in finding a protein that could serve as a marker since FOXP3, the transcription factor is specific for this uh, type of cell. Um, it's now very useful to identify the cells and then uh, try to isolate them and do functional assays. Uh, so we decided to um, investigate what was happening with the expression of neuropilin-1 in our system. And in our, our system was the skin transplantation model in mice. So we decided to do very uh, simple experiments to see what was happening with the expression of neuropilin-1 during the rejection or the acceptance of a skin transplant. So um, in our model, we, have, we use uh, B B6 mice and as uh, skin donors, we take a tail skin from a syngenaic uh, group or B6 animals or the allogeneic group, which is an F1 uh, mouse that comes from the cross between a valve C and a B6. And then we do the surgery in, uh, in the, on the back of the mouse and we wait for uh, 20 days for the readout um, around day 12 is when we see uh, signs of rejection. So we decided to include these two groups um, and uh, to take the animals down at day 20 and analyze their, the cells in the draining lymph nodes, um, uh, specifically on CD4 T cells. Um, we also included in the, in the staining CD25 and neuropilin-1. 
So here is a, a, a plot to show the staining for uh, these two molecules, CD25 and neuropilin-1. This is already gated on CD4 T cells in the syngenaic and also in the allogeneic group. And what we found is that um, CD4 T cells that are rejecting a skin graft are expressing neuropilin-1. And that this expression was very high. You can see here it almost reaches 30%. We also found a very high expression of neuropilin 1 in the syngenaic and also in the naive animals. So at least uh, what we were seeing was not very um, in line with what was published uh, a couple of years before the, this, sorry, this study our studies um, stating that this neuropilin one was a specific marker for, for T-Rex. We also did a, um, this is just a kinetics or the, the skin graft survival plots, as you can see here in B, um, the way that we plot the survival of the skin is not the animal, it's just the skin graft. So usually we see this rejection as I, I just, just mentioned at day 12, we see rejection of the skin graft. And then um, um, here, we what we did was to isolate regulatory T cells based on the expression of neuropilin-1. So we did a gating on CD4 T cells. We uh, also used neuropilin-1 and CD25. And we isolated the CD4s with high expression for these two markers, and we transferred into animals. And we found that based or, or, or just using neuropilin-1 as the marker for Treg, we can see a protection in skin rejection. So about 60% of the animals are accepting the skin grafts. <clears throat> All this is not on EVs yet, okay? Just this, this, this is just to give you a little bit of a uh, background. Um, so then another experiment we did was uh, to play a little bit with the cell populations. We isolated the T-Rex from a congenic, a congenically different animals, life 5.1s where the T-Rex and LIFI.2s were the effectors or the conventional T-cells. And we transferred these two populations into rag knockout animals. And then we did the same skin graft as before. And we took the animals at day 20. Why we did this, we did this experiment? Because we wanted to see what was happening with the expression of neuropilin-1 in both populations. What was happening with these T-Rex that are, were expressing high levels of neuropilin-1 in their membrane? And what was happening with the conventional T-cells that supposedly were negatives for neuropilin-1? So here in C is the staining for the analysis for the T-Rex. What we found was that the expression of neuro neuropilin-1 in T-Rex is, is stays um, very high, okay? So during inflammation, either syngenaic, we, I also say that, always say that during syngenaic, in the syngenaic condition, we, we get inflammation because of the surgery, right? And then because you get some infiltration at the beginning of different type of cells and that resolves as an, the acceptance. Of course, it's not the same type of inflammation observed in the, in the allogeneic graph, but still uh, there is some uh, inflammation in the site. Um, so under inflammation, there's no change in the expression of neuropilin-1. But then when we look at the effector cells, right, thanks to the congenic markers, what we found was that before the transfer of the cells, these effector cells were negative for neuropilin-1, the CD4s. When we transfer the effectors into a mouse that received a syngenaic piece of skin, um, these effectors upregulate neuropilin-1, 50% more or less. And then we also included a group of syngenaic uh, the syngenate group with effector cells plus regulatory T cells. We knew this was just the acceptance, 
but we wanted to see what was happening in 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 the in the companion of regulatory teaser that were expressing neuropilin one and we found that it's a little bit more expression of neuropilin one on the effectors when they are together with t-rex in the mouse and in the allogeneic condition during rejection the effectors also upregulate neuropilin one but there is an increment again on the expression of neuropilin one when they are co-transferred with regulatory T cells. So at this point, we didn't know the mechanistic, right? Well, we still don't know. <laughs> we are trying to figure it out. But um, what we found was that there was something happening, some crosstalk between the Treg and the effector cells and um, the expression of neuropilin 1 that was being controlled or mediated by the Treg or something from the Treg that was making these effector cells to upregulate or gain neuropilin 1 in their membrane. So um, next, um, we had the opportunity to obtain conditional knockout animals for neuropilin 1, specifically on regulatory T cells. So uh, we got one uh, line um, of mice expressing FOXP3 with the recombinase CRE and reporting uh, with YFP, and the other neuropilin 1 floxed flux, flux to obtain um, regulatory T cells expressing YFP, so we could track them by flow cytometry. And uh, these cells um, uh, were lacking neuropilin 1. So we decided to uh, first uh, do a suppression assay in vitro using the wall type. Here you can see in some of the graphs, you will see the three uh, genotypes, wild type, he heterozygous, and the knockout, and in some only two. Um, so we decided to take, uh, we take CD4 T cells, we stain them with CTB or CFSC, and then we co-culture them with regulatory T cells, either from wild types or heads or knockout for neuropilin 1. In this, in this assay, the cells are all in contact, are all together, the, convert, the, the effectors and the T-Rex in the same well. And in this case, we, um, in green, uh, you see the percentage of suppression, so almost 90% of suppression when we use wild-type regulatory T-cells. And um, we didn't see any differences in the level of suppression if neuropilin 1 was present or not on the regulatory T cells in this in vitro system. Then we decided to separate the cells. So what we did was to use a transwell uh, uh, chamber, right, the system in which we put regulatory T cells on top and the, conver the conventional T cells the cells that need to be uh, suppressed or, or inhibited on the bottom. And we repeated the same, the same conditions using the same type of cells. And what we found here was that um, regulatory T cells, when they are separate from the conventional T cells, they can suppress them uh, about 50%. Um, of they, they can suppress 50% of, of uh, the, the proliferate, proliferative cells. And uh, if neuropilin 1 was not present on the regulatory T cells, we found less suppression. So we thought that a, a soluble factor coming from the regulatory T cells is required by um, by the, the, the T-Rex to suppress the conventional T cells. Perhaps in the cell uh, the cell to cell contact system in the previous slide, um, there are other molecules that could be compensated, um, compensating for the lack of neuropilin one. And then we can see the the the, the suppression anyways. Um, 
or because of the this dissolvable factor, right? That um, could be mediating this uh, inhibition. And in this case, we can see that this dissolvable factor is dependent on the presence of neuropilin one. Remember the first part uh, of the experiments I show you in which um, we were seeing that the conventional T cells were upregulating or gaining neuropilin one expression when they were in contact with the, uh, the T-Rex, the wild type T-Rex expressing neuropilin one. Here we did the, the, the experiment. We took the conventional T cells that were not in contact with the T-Rex, right? In this uh, transwell system. And we check for neuropilin one expression. And what we found was that the, the effectors on the bottom of the plate um, were um, expressing neuropilin one when the wild type T-Rex were in the same uh, uh, well, right? In the same system, but not if we were using the knockout uh, the knockout T-Rex. So, <clears throat> sorry. Um, the upregulation of neuropilin-1 on the effector cells, it was not occurring if the T-Rex are neuropilin-1 uh, knockout. We also did the in vivo experiment, of course, <clears throat> and we corroborate the data from uh, before. The, the paper we published earlier. And this is the same in vivo experiment. Uh, in blue is the control of rejection. In green, dark green is the if we use, we, if we transfer the wild type T Rex. And in uh, black with a dotted line are the knockout T Rex for neuropilin 1. So these cells are unable to um, allow the acceptance of the skin graft. And when we look at the we look at the effectors and also the regulatory T cells in these animals, in the transplanted animals. Here I'm only including the staining for the regulatory T cells because on the effectors in this system, we didn't see any differences. But in the regulatory T cells, we found that um, the ones that are lacking neuropilin one are not as good producers of IL-10, which is an anti-inflammatory cytokine, and is, is one of the hallmarks for tolerance. And perhaps that could be explaining the, the inability of these uh, knockout T-Rex to induce uh, transplantation acceptance. So then um, we became interested in small extracellular vesicles um, basically for because of two reasons. One, because there was uh, only a couple of papers talking about uh, regulatory T cells producing small extracellular vesicles. And two, because in our center uh, of our university, most of the researchers work on small EVs, but in other topics, in neuroscience, in, uh, in the, the, uh, and also in mesenchymal uh, stem cell derived EVs. So we decided to see if our, in our hands, regulatory T cells, natural regulatory T cells were producing the small EVs if these EVs were able to induce transplantation tolerance uh, as a way of, as a mechanism of suppression, and also if neuropilin-1 was present and it had any role in this uh, potential uh, suppressive mechanism re uh, related with EVs. So what we did was to take, isolate, natural T-Rex from the three type of mice. And we did the NTA analysis to check for the, the size of the small EVs. The, the small EVs were uh, isolated using uh, ultra centrifugation. And here, as you can see that there's not much uh, difference 
in, on the size of the small EVs. Um, we also check for the presence of proteins that serve as markers for EVs. Uh, here is on EVs uh, between the wild types and also the knockout. We didn't see difference in the presence of Alix or TCH, um, um, TC, TSG, sorry, uh, 101, uh, between the wild type and the knockout uh, cells. And we tested also for neuropilin 1, and we found the protein in the EVs uh, coming from the natural T-Rex of wild type mice. And this was, this, this was novel because nobody uh, before reported neuropilin 1 on uh, small EVs from T cells. Then we decided to check if these um, EVs had any suppressive uh, function in vitro first. So we added a conventional T cells, uh, same assay than, than before. Uh, the T cells are uh, uh, stained with CTV in this case. And we polyclonally activate them in the presence of small EVs isolated from a wild type T Rex and the knockout T Rex. And what we found is um, this is the positive control. It, this is using the natural T Rex, it's not the EVs, it's just a cell. That's why the suppression is so high. But uh, the small EVs are able to um, block. T cell proliferation um, if the natural T Rex are wild types or if they are expressing a, a neuropilin 1 in their membrane. Um, and of course, the EVs have the neuropilin 1, right? Um, in the gray uh, symbols, here zero, we didn't see any um, suppression um, in the condition in which we add the small EVs coming from knockout uh, T-Rex cells. So uh, neuropilin 1 uh, is required for the suppression of regulatory T cells um, mediated by uh, small extracellular vesicles in vitro. And we also did the in vivo experiment in which we transplanted the skin on the back of the mouse and we injected the EVs coming from wild type T-Rex or from the knockout T-Rex. Um, the injections were performed locally. We uh, injected in uh, one day before the surgeries, we shaved the back of the mouse, and then we do four injections in the corners where the skin is gonna be placed on the following day. So this is how it looks in the control. So this is just a rag knockout animal with an F1 or an aloe skin. So it's fully accepted. And this is with no treatment, meaning that this mouse is a rag knockout that received CD4 T cells, effector cells, and the skin uh, gets rejected. This is just a scar. And then this, the, this piece is fully uh, lost. And, um, and then the hair, regrows and the mouse stays healthy. Not, nothing happened with the mouse. And then um, in these two conditions, the animals received the EVs, the injection of the EVs the day before the surgery in these four points, as just mentioned or show you in the diagram on the left. And uh, this is the situation uh, where in, in which we injected the EVs coming from the knockout T-Rex. And this is the survival uh, plot, uh, finding that uh, if you inject EVs from wild type T-Rex, you can um, promote a skin transplantation tolerance by 60%. But if um, the EVs come from T-Rex that are not expressing neuropilin 1, the survival uh, reaches 25%, more or less. Then we decided to analyze what was happening in the skin graft of these animals. We also analyzed the draining lymph node. In the draining lymph node, we didn't see any differences. That's why I didn't add the 
the, the, the figures or the plots, but are in the paper in the supplementary figures. Um, here I'm just showing you how it looks, the flow cytometry staining for the skin graft. When we look at the um, NK cells, we also look at macrophages, M1 and M2 type of macrophages. And here are the plots. We also included uh, neutrophils, dendritic cells, B cells, and other cell types. And the only uh, differences we found was on uh, macrophages. So here in the first plot, you can see that the M1 type of macrophages, which correspond to the inflammatory macrophages, if their frequencies don't change among the three different groups, rejecting animals, rejecting and treated with um, the EVs coming from wild type T-Rex and um, the ones that receive the EVs coming from the knockout T-Rex. But in the case of the M2 type of macrophages, which are these cells that have an anti-inflammatory function and also have a repair function, we found that um, the injection with the EVs coming from the wild type T-Rex, uh, we don't know if are increasing the recruitment of these M2 type macrophages into the skin graft, or if perhaps there are cells differentiating into M2 uh, type of uh, macrophages and uh, the condition uh, treated with the EVs coming from the knockout T-Rex have a less um, M2 cells. And in the third plot is just the ratio M2 over M, I mean, M1 over M2 uh, type of cells. And we see a higher ratio in the rejecting animals uh, that were treated with the EVs um, coming from the T-Rex that are not expressing neuropilin one. And then we also did a proteomic analysis. And um, here is just a, a selection of uh, proteins that were less enriched in the EVs coming from the T-Rex that do not express neuropilin-1. And um, for example, we have IL-2, uh, the alpha chain of the alpha IL-2 receptor, which correspond to CD25. This is a very interesting protein for us because CD25 is an activation marker and serves as a marker for uh, regulatory T cells. We also found granzyme B, uh, another protein very important for regulatory T cells. There are some cells, some T-Rex that are killers <laughs> and uh, they are cytotoxic and they, do this uh, activity uh, expressing granzyme B. So in the in the EVs coming from the knockout T-Rex, we found uh, less of this protein. Also CD73, uh, which is a, another marker and a very important protein for the function of, um, of T-Rex. And um, this is a Western blot uh, proving that uh, there, there was less um, CD73 in this case for, uh, on the EVs coming from the knockout uh, T-Rex. And here is the some of the functions that I just mentioned recently, but I just mark with the asterisk here that um, we recently uh, standardized the Western blood for CD25 and also for CD uh, 43. So we will um, um, extend uh, our um, studies uh, by proving the uh, or corroborating the data we found we obtained from the proteomic analysis. And we are also interested in um, ext extending this type of uh, study and analysis to other uh, subsets of uh, regulatory T cells as the ones that we could induce or produce in vitro instead of the ones that we use in this study, uh, which uh, corresponded to the T-Rex that are present in, in the mouse and um, that are the naturally derived from the thymus. 
And this is just as conclusion, uh, the neuropilin one is required by regulatory T cells to suppress or control T cell proliferation in vitro. Um, using the skin transplantation model, we, we also uh, demonstrated that neuropilin one is required uh, by the T-Rex and also is important its presence on the uh, small EVs coming from the T-Rex to promote a transplantation tolerance. Um, that T-Rex uh, require neuropilin 1 to produce um, IL-10 and also to modulate immune activation via uh, small extracellular uh, vesicles. And this is the last slide to uh, say thank you to the uh, lab members. Um, this, this work was performed by uh, one of our former PhD students, he's uh, doing his postdoc now in France, but um, Javiera, uh, she finished and, and retook uh, the small EVs and T-Rex uh, line of uh, research to continue with some of the, the answers that uh, questions that we still haven't answered. And also thank you to the collaborators, Francisca Alcayaga from our university, Ursula Bineken also from our institution, uh, Dr. Tilo Kahn from Germany, who is the person who uh, does the proteomic analysis and the funding uh, of our national agency of uh, investigation and also the ICEF for this invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karina. Fantastic work. So it's been uh, very interesting for me to, to hear more about your findings. And I, I do have some questions for you, but I would like to just emphasize to everybody that if you have questions, if you have comments, please put them in the chat box and then uh, we, will, we will get to you there. Um, I am going to allow unmuting, just changing the, toggling the switches here, um, so so you will be able to um, to interact with Karina today. Um, so let me start with a couple of questions. Okay. Um, one of those is just about the role of the neuropillin in in EV biogenesis, and so you you know you noted that you didn't see evidence of it being involved in biogenesis. Um, and I'm wondering, um, you, I think you also mentioned in the discussion that that you know maybe there are some things that could still be confirmed there, though. Um, could you expand on that and and what what assays you think are still needed to to really prove that neuropillin one is not involved in biogenesis? Um, so let's see. We at least the only thing to claim that um that neuropilin one is not involved in biogenesis was the first that the production in uh, means the number of particles that we get per uh, number of cells that we activate in culture the number of these particles is not uh, changed um, in between the wild type and the knockout t-rex and um, that the proteins that are used as canonical markers for small EVs, we didn't observe um, differences in the abundance of this protein, at least by Western blood. That's the only two uh, piece of evidence we have to say that um, the neuropilin one is not involved in the biogenesis of the EVs. Um, what I would like to see a uh, check is how neuropilin one is um, is is present in in terms of the um, location on the EV. Is the neuropilin one is is we we have some uh, some idea that neuropilin one is in the membrane. Of the of the EVs as in the cell, but perhaps the EVs could be loaded with neuropilin one as well, and maybe that way could be mediating something on the effector cells because at some point 
when we start seeing the differences um, in the, I don't want to say expression, evidence of neuropilin 1 being more abundant on the membrane of effector cells when co-transferred with wild type T-Rex, um, we thought that um, perhaps where exchange of membrane between the two cell types and maybe that was a way that the conventional T cells were gaining neuropilin one in the membrane and not necessarily upregulating per se or de novo the expression of neuropilin one on the effectors. Um, we have to do some experiments in which we have the EVs and um, we want to incubate them with antibody against neuropilin one and then redo the in vitro assays to see if uh, neuropilin one, if it's outside of the, ve the vesicle, is mediating the suppression by interacting with something on the effectors. Or if there is something inside of the if the neuropilin one is inside of the EV, um, could be following on other, other pathway. But we don't have much information about that um, the area. Yeah, thanks for that answer. Um, that, that's very comprehensive. And um, you know, I guess you do see evidence that there are certain factors that are more abundant in the EVs that are that are coming from you know one condition or the other. Um, so, so maybe the, do you think that the neuropilin is actually binding to some of these proteins or helping to recruit them? Um, so the, uh, that's another, um, other type of experiment we have to do. We, we delay them because of the, because of the pandemic. And we had a, uh, some issues with a mouse colony during the pandemic as well. But one of the, exp the pending experiments is to do and visualize the, the immunological synapse. So having antigen presenting cells that are expressing, we know that are expressing neuropilin one, and then co-culture them with um, regulatory T cells, wild type or knockouts, and include the, include the conditions with the EVs coming from the wild types and coming from the knockout since in, only in humans, um, it was described that dendritic cells will bind or interact for longer times with regulatory T cells. And this way, it would be a way to um, stabilize the interaction and promote tolerance because of the high presence of neuropilin 1 on regulatory T cells and not on the effectors. But um, in our case, we don't know, uh, and we haven't done it yet, um, this type of uh, experiment to see interaction. Now, neuropilin 1 also interacts with the VGF receptor and also semaphorins. And um, we haven't gone through all that side of the story to see if VGF is involved, maybe involved in these um, in these uh, responses, and perhaps could serve as as, as a as a I don't want to say chemokine, but a recruiting factor, and could be perhaps mediating the the um, migration of certain cell types into the skin graft in this case. Excellent. Okay. Um, so I really love this glitch that we have on Zoom where um, m my initials sometimes show up when Clotilde is asking questions. And so if you see a very um, a very insightful question on, on this uh, call, you'll know that it's coming from Clotilde and not from me. <laughs> <laughs> so, Clotilde, go ahead with your uh, with your question here. No, yeah, it's it's really weird indeed that <laughs> when I write, it's your initials <laughs> instead of mine. But actually, you are you answered part part of my questions. But then I had another one, which is, um, well, of course, as you know, I'm always interested in the 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 subcellular origin of EVs. 
and I, I, um, I was wondering whether you did any intracellular uh, staining of neuropidin one in the T uh, regs, and whether you know if it's uh, mostly at the plasma membrane or whether it could be enriched in multivesicular bodies, and and whether the EVs that you're uh, studying are possibly more likely to be ectosomes or, or exosomes. Uh, but yeah, I mean. That's you didn't That's look at CD63, for instance, right? In your in your uh, EVs, you had other interesting markers, but uh, the CD63. CD? No, 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 yeah. no, no. We haven't done that. Uh, we haven't checked for that protein, and that's a, the the first part you just mentioned is a great great question and suggestion because at some point. Um, we want to do the intracellular staining for a uh, neuroblin one yes yeah so okay. that's a yes that's a that's a very good point and and just so my initial question was about the binding whether you thought that the neuropidin was promoting the binding and I, I know you did answer part of that but I saw you have a, a leukocyanin in your uh, that's regulated by neuropidin and leukocyanin is probably also promoting binding to of of evs to cells don't don't you think so are you planning to yeah we to... just we did the that's the cd43 right yes right yeah. yes yes so we just have the this week in fact uh, javier got the plot uh, working so we have now the assay in in um just to prove right first that we have more or less between the wild type and the knockout and uh and then we can uh, get more antibodies to check either by flow cytometry or do some of the functional experiments by blocking the certain uh, molecules yeah thank you no, lots thank of work you. <laughs> lots of work to do thank you yes i know now we are back from vacation so now we have to retake everything Good. So you had mentioned VEGF, and we actually have a question from Lothar Dieterich about uh, VEGF and maybe some mechanistic things here. Oh, I'm oh hi. Yeah, thanks. Actually, in I'm a way, you answered my, my question already. So I'm wondering a little bit how you envision this to work or what, what is really the function of neuropillin? One, um, my thought was it might perhaps scavenge VGF and, and it could affect perhaps vascularization of the skin transplants. And that could, of course, have secondary effects on transplant rejection or not. But as you said, you haven't investigated this really yet. Yeah, no. But I, I was wondering the... if instead you could anyway elaborate a little bit what you think is really the, the, the way how these EVs work. So do you think they directly interact with these M2 macrophages and have a direct effect? Or do they interact with other cells in the skin and, and, and what the role of neuropilin in, in this really is? So at, at, because of the effect we found um, on the macrophages, I think that macrophages that are in a uh, resident of the in, in the transplant in the in the tissue are uptaking the EVs and uh, promoting this M2 type of phenotype and then uh, having less or bringing less inflammation or, or controlling the activation of the effectors. Um, as I said, we didn't in the in the when we analyzed the draining lymph node, we didn't see a robust difference on the type of T helpers because we check for TH1, TH17, and also T-Rex, I believe. And um, we didn't see big differences. We saw a, a tendency to get higher TH17s um, in the treatment with the EVs coming from the knockout uh, T-Rex, uh, but that was not a, you know, like a statistically different, but um, I think it's impacting on the immune cells that like to eat things and capture as the macrophages. And these could be changing the phenotype of these cells. We have this indirect data, right? And um, we would like to do some of the, uh, to do a staining on the skin graft because we could, we can stop a little bit 
before the the rejection is 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 happening you know like fully and then um or do time points and and stain the the evs and and then check where the evs are if they are being captured or not by the macrophages or other cell types um i would like to see if the evs make it all the way to the draining lymph nodes as well um yeah, um, yeah. so those uh, sort of experiments are are in our list as well all right so just to follow up briefly then I, I i understand you analyzed the draining lymph node but you didn't see major effects on the t-cell pool but did you look at at, at lymph node resident macrophages as well and the macrophages in the lymph node no no Okay. No, we didn't do it because, yeah, we had to do an extra uh, an extra step when we have to digest, do like a mild digestion of the of the of the lymph nodes um, to release the macrophages and also the dendritic cells and check their mm -hmm. phenotype. And we wanna we didn't want to mess up with the intracellular staining for the cytokine. So. Um, yeah, we could check for the macrophages uh, as well, and then retic cells. We mm. could do both at the same time. All right. Thank you. Great. And then we have a question from Anand. So, Anand, are you are you in Kansas City, the home of our Super Bowl winners? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I just saw that. Yes. <laughs> ah, look at that! Oh my goodness! Yes. Yeah, so, so, but you are an EV Club MVP, like uh, like Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> so, so please. Uh, share your uh your your thoughts with us here today yeah uh karina that was like a great talk i just have a very uh naive question when you uh talk about uh neurofilling which is a which has a very broader expression and uh function uh in in in, in mice biology how do you say that like knocked out, knockout of uh neurofilling one is just uh affecting your screen uh, skin transplant and your immunity or innate immunity over there how come what about the, the global effect of neurofilin knockouts what oh, happened so um the the neuropilin one um is only knocked down on regulatory t cells in in these animals oh, and when we when we check for the other you know like other um markers for instance of regulatory t cells we didn't observe any differences on FOXP3 expression, um, uh, CD73 in the membrane. This is in, it is interesting here because in in the cell, the cell between the wild type and the knockout look the same, but then when the EVs are made uh, and released, and we check for the content of proteins, is there where we see the difference. Uh, okay, so um, uh, it's not a knockout and a whole knockout animal, no. Oh, uh, okay. So uh, my, uh, my, uh, sorry, I kind of got it wrong in between. So that was my concern. Thank you. Thank you for answering. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Okay. So I think we've come to the end of the questions in the chat box, but I just want to follow up again on an, a point that was raised earlier and and ask you for really just an opinion here. Do you think that there is a role for cytoplasmic cargo transfer here, or do you or do you feel that it's mostly the engagement of these signaling pathways through interactions um, at the membrane? So, for example, with I the think, N2, I, I, you know, I think they're taking them up, but are they actually transferring cargo into the cytoplasm? I um, yes, um, I I think that neuropilin one is involved in how these EVs are being loaded with different um, components. Of course, we only check here for the proteins, but perhaps there are differences in, in, in other, you know, I don't know, microRNA or, or, or other, um, other molecules that are involved in the suppression mechanism of regulatory T cells. I don't think it's only is surface to surface interaction between the EV and the target cell. All right, well, very good. Well, that will then um, conclude the EV club for today. So Karina, thank you so much thank for you. joining us. We've really enjoyed uh, hearing from you, learning from you. 
and we wish you all the best as you continue this exciting work. So um, thanks also to everyone who joined today for all the good questions and for your attention. And we will look forward to seeing you again at a future EV club. So thank thanks you. so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.